All righty, welcome to my talk. Uh, uh, my name is Tim Allison. I've been asked to speak at the podium, so I will stay at the podium. I will not wander around and be a dynamic speaker like I've been trained to be, as if I've had training. Um, anyways, I work at the MITRE Corporation. I'm a committer on Apache POI, PDF Box, and Tika. Uh, so off we go with uh, evaluating text extraction uh, with Apache Tika's new Tika eval module. And this is where the next slide happens, naturally. Yay, okay, so I have a, a bunch of debts of gratitude. Uh, my, my, my debt of gratitude is rather large. First to uh, David Smiley, uh, committer on uh, Apache Solar, who first got me off of my laptop and into open source. Uh, I, w without him, I, I, would, I would definitely not be here. Nick Birch, uh, of course, uh, brought me in, even though my first patches were done in Notepad. Uh, and Groovy uh, converted to Java. Um, so sorry, and yet thank you so much, Nick. Uh, same for Chris Matman, who uh, fostered my early, uh, early stuff and has been a fantastic uh, collaborator uh, on Tika. Uh, Tillman Hauscher on Apache PDF Box has been a great colleague uh, in working with especially this eval stuff and helping us figure out what metrics we want to use uh, in the eval. Uh, Dominic Stadler. Uh, from the Apache POI project has been uh, really helpful in um, bird of a feather in gathering common crawl data and running large-scale regression testing. And of course, all of my other fellow devs and users on Apache Commons, POI, PDF Box, Tika, and the entire ASF community, thank you all. Uh, this is a marvelous community to be, to be a part of. So those are the people. Uh, also, I'm hugely indebted to Common Crawl, the Common Crawl project, uh, from which we've gathered uh, a number of documents so that we can run our regression testing, and also the GovDocs1 corpus, uh, which was gathered a number of years ago. And then Rackspace has uh, kindly hosted a VM for us, and I'll talk about uh, that uh, public VM uh, shortly. So anyways, I'd like to start by saying thank you to so many people. So an overview of the talk today, uh, I'll talk a little bit about content and metadata extraction in case anybody somehow doesn't know anything about Tika. This is the Tika Medium or Tika 200 class, not the Tika 101, um, but I'll go over a little bit of what it does. I'll talk a little bit about the motivation for Tika eval. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with text extraction? I will tell you um, at least some of the things I've encountered. And I'll talk about an overview of what's in the new package, the workflow in using it, and then I'll uh, go back and forth a little bit and talk, share a little bit about our uh, terabyte public corpus that we use for uh, regression testing before the next version of Tika, before the next version of POI, and also um, PDF box. I'll also talk about limitations. Uh, I do not have an easy button. I've seen the word magic in two talks earlier today. I have no magic, sorry. Um, I also, yeah, so if you came for magic, I, I don't want to disappoint. It's still early. David North is giving a fantastic talk on Apache Poi in the room over there. So if, if you're looking for magic, that might be a better option. All right, so you might ask, if you are paying attention to these things and looking at my slides from two years ago, well, what's, what's really different from your talk two years ago? Well, now it works, and now it's actually integrated into Tika. Uh, and it will come out with the next uh, release, which we should be kicking off tonight or tomorrow. Uh, I think we're cleared to go now on uh, Tika 115. So a lot of work has been done, especially uh, iterating uh, with Tillman Hauscher on, uh, on PDF box uh, to improve uh, evaluation. Uh, a, lot is, a lot of things have, have been improved, and it, out, it now basically works. So first off, content extraction and human language technology. For folks who do more fun things like entity extraction and search and machine translation and whatnot, the stuff that we do on Apache Tika is really boring. We get stuff from all sorts of different file formats at the bottom over that red line so that they then have text so that then they can do the more interesting things uh, like search uh, or entity extraction and so on. But it's a challenge to get all of those different file formats, figure out which file, which, which type of file you're looking at, and then ap apply the appropriate parser. A nice thing about Apache Tika and the goal of it is to have the same interface no matter what type of file you uh, aim at it so that we don't all have to go and reinvent our own uh, file ID and then figure out which, which parsers to apply. So the whole goal of Apache Tika is to get from bytes at the bottom to something that we can then process at, at a higher level. Um, speaking of which, I learned that this week is uh, National Infrastructure Week in the U.S., uh, celebrating infrastructure projects that nobody pays attention to or nobody cares about. So 
this is not deep learning IoT stuff, um, but it is critical to, uh, to, to those kinds of things because if content extraction fails, those other uh, downstream more interesting and more exciting projects will also not uh, fare well. So typically, uh, high-level components of a media processing stack, you start out with files or structured data. Uh, then you throw those into your something, and of course this is multi-step of collapse this because I'm interested in the bottom part. Um, and then you have a user interface on top of that, and I'll come back to this shortly. But let's not forget about metadata. Another useful thing that Tika does is it will pull out metadata that's embedded or stored within the documents. So you can often get the who, at least, <laughs> who said they were, who, who, who self-identified as the author. You can get digital signatures, you can get company um, from emails, the from twos and so on. You can often get uh, hardware versions or names, uh, software versions or names. You can sometimes get uh, globally unique file IDs if your file happens to have XMP in it, which can be quite useful for some uh, use cases. You can also get title and keywords. Sometimes you can even get uh, geolocation. So for images that have uh, uh, latitude and longitude, you can extract that. Sometimes even you can get the original file location for where it was last saved on, on somebody's hard drive. Uh, or sometimes you can get that for embedded images in a file. Um, I thought that Microsoft had been moving away from that, but I just discovered recently that Microsoft has started putting that back into uh, XLSX files in their future-ish thing for uh, OOXML. So we can now extract where uh, somebody last saved. Uh, their XLSX file, which for some applications may be useful. And then also, of course, when, when it was created, last modified, and printed. So beyond the standard types, there's all sorts of fun custom metadata that you can pull out of files if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, if you're into that kind of thing. So this is uh, what I call blood, in the, blood on the Highway, uh, which is a reference to uh, driving films from when I was younger, or actually from before my time, where people were being scared scared straight about you know not, not drinking and driving or uh, being careful while driving. When I talk about these things, these kinds of things don't happen all the time in Tika. Tika actually works really, really well. But given that I sit and watch the JIRA a whole lot and given that I run Tika against a whole lot of files, I see a lot of things that can go wrong with Tika. So that's what you're hearing from me today. What you should not take away from this is that Tika is a total disaster and you should run from it. Um, it actually does work quite well. Uh, but this is more of the um, kind of a, a taxonomy of when things go wrong with text extraction coming up. So in this example application, I focus on search, which is one of the more um, basic and primary things that people often do with content that's pulled out of slides, or out of, excuse me, out of uh, files. What I've seen in a number of places where I've worked is the we have kind of content metadata extraction or data from a uh, structured data store search system, and then we have that user interface. And the amount of attention that's applied to each layer, at least in the couple of places where I've seen these kinds of systems, is all at the user interface. Um, as long as somebody can enter in a search term and some documents come back, the users are happy, the managers are happy, the GUI developers are happy, it works. Everything just works. This is marvelous. But where I don't see as much effort put in is all of the is any regression testing or any testing on the the lower parts of the stack, which frankly aren't that interesting. And we just it's oftentimes that people hope that that the components at those levels are just working, and they trust that those are working often without checking. So as you know, when things go wrong with the foundation, you know stuff happens. So what can go wrong? And here's my taxonomy of things that can go wrong. Not to scare you away, um, but one, we have completely expected exceptions. Expected exceptions? Yes, they are expected exceptions. So if you have truncated files, our parsers are not designed to handle truncated files. Some handle some types of truncated files better than others. If it's a password protected file and you don't have a password, we're not, we're not handling it. If the format version isn't handled or if the file type isn't handled, we aren't going to be able to do anything with that. And sometimes they're just plain corrupt files uh, for whatever reason, and we're not going to be able to do those. And of course, there's a spectrum of corruption. So it could be the case that the main application that's associated with it, Adobe Reader, for example, can get text out of a file, but we can't. The flip side also happens sometimes. The PDF box is able to get content out of a file where, P where Adobe Reader is not able to. Um, and sometimes you op try to open it up and you, you just get nothing. So there, there's a, a, a continuum, a spectrum of, of what I mean by corrupt file. And then you have the somewhat expected exceptions. So a parser has a problem with a non-corrupt file. The code base for Tika, we're now at 50 megs-ish of a jar. 
There's a lot of code in there um, and a lot of moving parts. Uh, we don't have eyes on all of the code all of the time. Each, uh, each dependency is constantly being upgraded uh, and uh, improved. Uh, so we don't have a chance to, to look into all of that code and follow all of that to do um, rigorous you know, code reviews of, of what's coming into Tika. So it happens that parsers sometimes have some problems uh, and hopefully they will throw an exception and, and you'll be done with it and everything's fine and you can log that exception and hopefully open a ticket on the JIRA, get it fixed and then it will be fixed in the next version of Tika, ideally. And sometimes there are just corrupt files that nothing can handle and there's not a lot that we can do about that. All right, so note that when you do get exceptions, uh, especially of the somewhat expected exception category, you may get some text, you may get some metadata, it all depends on the parser. Um, so if you do get an exception, don't necessarily throw out whatever you got from the handler. You may still, that may still be of use for some use cases, uh, search for example, or other, other things. So those are the basic problems. We also have catastrophic problems. Now, these happen really rarely, uh, fortunately. Um, and the good news is that when they happen, you, you often know about it. Um, not always, but sometimes you do. So out of memory errors. And out of memory errors can be not so bad sometimes. Yeah, it will corrupt your JVM and it could be a real problem. But what really gets interesting is when you're approaching an OOM and Java's, the garbage collector is just trying. So if you're even running a single threaded parser, against one file and you somehow trigger something that, that kicks off the garbage collector, you can bring down an entire box. And it's just snail's pace and it's, it's really, it's, it's dramatic to watch. It's, it's an entertaining thing to watch, unless you're, I don't know, in production uh, or you know, doing, doing something else that matters and people care about. Um, but from my perspective, if I get one of these files off the JIRA, it's, it's an entertaining thing uh, and exciting, don't get me wrong. The other is sometimes you can get an out of memory error from a four byte file. Uh, just because something went wrong with the parser. Uh, there was a, a misunderstanding in the parser and you can get an out of memory uh, error. The other, when you get those at least, you know something's gone wrong. Um, slowly building memory leaks are a little more interesting um, unless you're doing profiling and really paying attention. Uh, you often don't realize what's going on. Uh, so again, you can get garbage collection uh, issues where you're just running five threads. How could you possibly be pegging your, your quad core machine? Well, it, it may be a slow building memory leak and the garbage collector is working on all threads or multi-threaded to try to clean up some of that memory. Permanent hangs are a joy to behold. That's also, that, that typically only results in a single thread hanging. Um, it, it won't often corrupt the, or take up the entire machine. Uh, but when those hit, those can be quite uh, exciting. And TK1132 has some nice uh, descriptive narrative for you if you care to follow about what happens when a parser just goes into an infinite, effectively an infinite loop. Um, that can also be a real problem. We also have had a couple of security vulnerabilities, which we fixed uh, in one, at least by the ones that we're, we're aware of, we fixed by 1.14. Um, so we had a couple of XXEs, uh, which we fixed. Uh, we also had this great arbitrary code execution um, vulnerability. So that somebody who carefully crafted a MATLAB file would be able to run whatever software they felt like on your, on, on your uh, computer that was running Tika. Um, which is really exciting uh, in the wrong way. So again, this is blood on the highway. These are extremely rare uh, issues, but these can happen. And if you are in production, if you are handling, as uh, Nick says, millions of files or billions of files from the internet that you don't trust necessarily, these things will happen. And uh, if you are running Tika in the same JVM that you're running your indexer, these things can cause real problems. Uh, so please do not do that or just beware that these things can happen. All right, so those are the kind of expected exceptions, the really, really rare exceptions, and then there are the hidden problems that you're not really aware happened. And these can be, you can get garbled text out of, the, out of the content extraction from slightly garbled to totally hosed, and I have some examples of that. We also have missing text, uh, where you have just blocks of text are missing from the document. You would expect to get uh, much more text if you open it up in the native uh, application that's supposed to handle that file. You get a whole bunch of text, but when you run it through uh, Tiki, you don't get much at all. You can, miss, um, you can be missing attachments, uh, thanks to a bug that I added uh, and then fixed just in time before 1.15, uh, before the process for voting for 1.15. Um, and also, if you are using the classic uh, Tika handlers, which just pulls text out of documents or uh, XHTML, the default there was to swallow embedded file exceptions. So if you had a zip file that contained a whole bunch of Excel files, 
And those Excel files all happened to be generated by the same source, and that particular version of Excel was a little bit different from most. You could wind up getting exceptions on all those files, and you would never know it. Uh, because Tika doesn't let you, in the default use of Tika, we do not let you know that there was an exception on an embedded file. One batch of documents I, I recently reviewed showed that they had 50% of, 50 of their Excel files were getting exceptions, and the, the folks who were running Tika had no idea because they were running the classic, um, the, the classic method, which has no warnings about these things. So those are things where you're not getting an exception, but something could still kind of go not, not as well as one might like. So examples, examples. Here we have the highway. So this is what happened on one file when we upgraded from PDF box 1.8 to 1, uh, 1.86 to 1.87. We were getting the text on the top, and then when we upgraded, we got the text on the bottom. Um, it's a complete single substitution cipher, uh, so that capital T goes to capital B, lowercase a goes to capital G, fine. Um, this would pass Ziffian distribution beautifully. Uh, it would pass word length statistics beautifully, because all the words are the same length. Um, but now you're throwing all of these brilliant words into your solar uh, index, or your Lucene index, and now you, you're, you're blowing out your, of course, solar strong, Lucene strong. You're not actually going to blow out the index with this noise. But you are adding a whole bunch of noise to your index, and your users can't find the document. So it's, it's, it's two great things that happen when this kind of, things ha when this kind of thing happens, is you're, you're let, making your index suboptimal, and also people can't find the documents they need. This is an example of missing text, and this was one of the issues, I think, that uh, initially got me out of my notepad developing laptop um, and into uh, open source, and Nick put up with so much uh, on this uh, little patch I had for this particular issue. Um, this is this poor person's uh, CV uh, with lots of great detail about what she does, and that's all that Tika pulled out. So th this is mildly amusing because it doesn't look to us like it has real-world consequences, but if you think about recruiters or anybody in that company looking for particular keywords, they're not going to be able to find that for this person. Um, so these can have real-life consequences when text extraction uh, does not work. And again, you can run all sorts of metrics on this, and it would pass a number of them because it, it's basically you're getting English-ish stuff out of there. Um, you're getting some text out of there, but you're not getting the full document. So this is an example of missing text. Some other things that can happen is you may get some noise. If a PDF has been scanned and it has embedded OCR in there, uh, or text that's been generated by OCR, you could get some noise in there. And that's, you know, we, we, we all know and, and expect that kind of thing sometimes in PDFs. Um, but this was a great example where you have the image, you have the text that was extracted, and you can prove to people that you can find this exact document if you search for III monitoring on Google. Because Google, at this point, was relying on the text that was stored in the document. In this case, it happened to be OCR. All right. So basically, my main point on this is that if you take whatever you get out of Tika and throw it into Solar and then throw a great user interface on top of that and hope for the best, you don't know what you can't find. So please take a little bit of time, if possible, to do some kind of evaluation on the content that you're getting out. Um, so that's, that's the blood on the highway uh, chunk of, of the talk uh, for some examples of things that can go wrong. Again, Tika works quite well a lot of the time. Um, so, so please don't um, go and build another Apache project that pulls content out of documents. Um, all right. So, the dream from all of this is Tika 1302. Uh, so my dream was I was motivated by all of this stuff of the above. We have only about 1,000 test files between uh, POI, PDF Box, and Tika. It sounds like a fair number, but it really isn't, given the amount of marvelous things that can happen in, uh, in uh, PDF files and also in Microsoft Office files. And I'm just talking here about uh, PDF and, and Microsoft Office. Uh, of course, we handle a number of other file formats. So 1,000 test files sounds like a lot. It's not. The other motivation behind T Tika 1302 is that some groups made the mistake of giving me right access to their projects. So unit tests are nice, but against me, come on, you're not going to cover all of, the, all of the stuff I'm going to ruin in your code base. So this was another motivation for why I had the dream of T Tika 1302. So my dream was to run uh, Tika against a much larger corpus, either nightly or weekly or something, and then automatically recognize regressions. And this seemed like a great thing. We have regression testing. Um, we have uh, you know, continuous integration. We have all these systems set up. That's great. 
there is no magic, and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. So that was the dream. As part of this dream, one of the components was some evaluation metric that could say how well did we get how how well did text come out of here, uh, or how well are we getting text versus how well were we getting text with an earlier version of Tika or a different tool. So Tika eval, let's focus on that now. For now, that's the component within the larger dream of, okay, so you've extracted some text. How languagey is it? Do you have some kind of sense of how well you did? Uh, or can you compare two different groups? So this, as I mentioned, is available in, uh, or will be available in Tika 1.15, uh, which should be coming out shortly. Okay, so a high-level overview of what's in the Tika eval module. It does not run in Spark. I'm sorry. Um, so it's I, I I don't have any um, any of the, the 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 cool hip things that that all of the kids are using nowadays. Um, but it runs from file share to file share. Um, there is no bat scripting involved yet. Uh, there's no Perl here, um, but it does run file share to file share. And the notion is, if you do have a modern um, document processing pipeline, Spark, Hadoop, and so on, then at least with Tika eval, you can do a random sample of what you have and run it file share to file share. Or, as I mentioned, our Jira is open. Um, the committers are standing by. So if you do want to add an integration point for Tika, or even just share lessons learned, let us know. As, as Nick pointed out in his talk, one of the great things about Hadoop is it will try files again and again. And unless you tell it to stop trying files, it, you could run into some problems. So you have to be careful in, uh, in the, in the large-scale uh, processing frameworks. So the scope of Tika eval is really quite humble. It's file share to file share. And there are basically two modes. One is uh, profile a single extraction run. So if you run Tika against a batch of documents uh, and you have a, a parallel uh, directory structure with the original binary documents and the text that was extracted, uh, you can run a profile on that and say how many exceptions did I have per MIME type, uh, what languages were detected, um, what, what's the uh, number of words per page ratio, which can give you insight into whether your PDFs are uh, image only perhaps or can go, give you other insight. So there are a number of things, and I'll talk about that. The other big mode is, is two extraction runs. And the notion here is, hey, if you have ground truth, great. If you're running an OCR study and you have ground truth for what text should have been uh, OCR'd, you can use Tika eval, the compare mode, to run ground truth against what you're currently getting out. Or you can experiment with different settings in your OCR to see which one overall gives you better uh, performance on your batch of documents. You could also be comparing uh, different tools. Uh, and I'm not saying that there are other tools besides the one Apache Tika uh, to pull content out. Um, in the Python world, for example, there wouldn't be anything similar to that. Um, but uh, you could, if you wanted to, I guess, compare other tools to some of the things in uh, Apache Tika. Or you could compare uh, tool A uh, with settings X, tool A with settings uh, Y, or even just two different versions of Apache Tika. So when we say that we have a new, great new version out, you can run Tika eval on your documents to see if there are major regressions that would prevent you from upgrading. Uh, and when that happens, please do open tickets, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So that's a high-level overview of the scope and basically the two modes. Before I go much further, I do have a couple of definitions uh, that I've <laughs> come up with on, uh, or excuse me, that the Tika eval community uh, has come up with, and the community would be uh, a bus quotient of one, uh, largely. So the original documents or container documents, those are just the binary files that you aim Tika at, whether it's an actual text file or whether it's a Word file that might have attachments. I just call them original documents or container documents. Embedded documents are anything that show up inside that document, which are basically viewed by some people or many people as an embedded document. That could be, for example, an attachment on an email. It could be an actually embedded file. You can embed a doc file inside a PDF and then put a, a zip inside that doc file and do all sorts of um, uh, Matryoshka uh, doll things. Or it could be a file format that doesn't really ever exist outside of being an embedded document, like EMF or WMF or XMP or XFA. So some file formats really don't exist on their own. So by embedded document, I mean anything that shows up inside a document and is basically recognized as an embedded document. Another term is extract. So an extract covers anything that you pulled out of a document. Uh, there are two basic modes in uh, Tika eval. One is text. So this is useful for if you're running another uh, content extraction tool and it just pulls out text. You can you have the text extract, what text was extracted from that. We also have uh, this uh, recursive parser JSON stuff, and I'll talk about that in the next uh, two slides. Tika uh, eval was basically designed for uh, the JSON format, uh, but based on ApacheCon from two, two years ago, um, I added the .text handling option. 
yeah, so in, in I'll talk, or the details on handling.txt files are, as extracts are all on our wiki. All right, so why the recursive parser wrapper? So let's say that some person has taken a, a zip, a, a, an embedded, embed4.txt file, thrown that in a zip file, put that in another zip file, put that in another zip file, another zip file, and then put that in a Word file. So now you have this, this massively um, hierarchical um, bunch of documents all in a nice Microsoft Word file. In the classic Tika extraction that is handled as one um, collection of SACS uh, events, and the way that embedded documents are handled is you have a div class for that embedded uh, file, embed1, embed1a, and you get the embedded path for where that embedded file is, and then you get the text that's extracted from that. And given the framework of, of streaming, that's kind of what could happen. Um, that's what you can do with, with embedded documents. But one problem with this is that the embedded document, the metadata from those embedded documents is lost. So if you have a zip file of image files, and those image files actually have latitudes and longitudes, with the old version, or the classic version of using XHTML, all of those lat longs could no longer be processed, and you'd lose them. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, we swallow embedded exceptions without warning you at this point. Um, so that's another uh, area of concern. Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing is that sometimes with classic XHTML, we try the best we can to get the metadata out of a document before writing the XHTML, but sometimes we can't get metadata until we get further down the parse of the original document. So it could be the case that you get metadata extracted from a file, but it doesn't show up in the XHTML. So to solve these problems, um, I stole code uh, from Nick and Yuka uh, and put that into Tika, and call, we're calling it now the recursive parser wrapper. And you can get to this uh, through Tika app. It's the capital J option or R meta, the endpoint in Tika eval. And this gives you a list of metadata objects for each embedded document. And then each metadata object has the content type, or it has all of the metadata with a special met metadata key of X Tika content, and that's the actual text that was extracted from the document. So this will maintain stack traces for embedded documents, and it will maintain content for all of the embedded documents like we had in the traditional, but it will also uh, meant, uh, maintain all of your embedded metadata, so you can get all of your latitudes and longitudes if those images are put in a zip file. So in Tika eval, everything is built around this, but we do have a way to handle uh, regular dot t flat text files uh, for extracts. So the workflow uh, for profile. You, you generate your extracts. Um, in my case, it's uh, use Tika uh, batch, uh, Tika, ba Tika in batch mode, so um, Java jar Tika app dash uh, I for input directory, O for output directory, and then we have a parallel directory of input files and extract files. Then we run the profiler uh, to populate an in-process H2 database, and there's the Java command for that. You specify the extracts directory and uh, what you want to name your, your uh, H2DB. And after you do that, that, that calculates a number of statistics, puts them in, in the database, and then you can dump the reports. And the reports are driven by a whole bunch of SQL that's stored in an XML file that you can modify. So you can choose which reports you want to run on that batch of documents. Tika comes with reports that I've found to be useful, uh, or SQL uh, that I've run against the um, H2 that have found to be useful. And then those reports are XLSX files, and then you can go rummage through those. A directory full of a bunch of XLSX files is not a GUI. Um, it's a horrible interface. It's abysmal, but it's better than what we had. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, but if anybody knows JavaScript uh, at all and wants to pitch in on Tika 1334, it would be really nice to have a user. Yeah, it would, it would be nice. To, somebody ought to be doing it. Um, it would be nice to have a user interface uh, for that because uh, navigating through the directory, navigating through the reports can be a bit of a challenge at this point. Let nobody mistake, I do not believe that a bunch of Excel files uh, is sufficient as, 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 as reporting on this, but it's what we have. And next slide. All right, the other one, so that's profile. That's when you have a single run. The other one is compare. And for that, you run Tika on two different, uh, you run two different versions of Tika. You have an extracts A directory and an extracts B directory. And then you just run the compare tool, and that will compare extracts A with extracts B, pump all of that uh, comparison information into the uh, H2 database, and then you dump the reports from that. And again, you have reports. You have all of the individual reports you would get from the profiling mode for each of those uh, A and B. And then you also have some comparison statistics uh, that compare A with B. 
And let me talk about some of the features uh, that we can extract or that we can get out of uh, A and B. All right, I'm sorry, there's, there's one other tool, and that's start DB. So this just starts the H2 database, so you can navigate to localhost and actually interact with the database if you want. And that can be really useful, as, especially as you're developing the SQL for the reports that you want to develop. All right. So for, pro, for the reports for in the profile mode, we get count of metadata values, we get um, counts of attachments, we get MIME counts uh, for containers and embedded documents, so you get a sense of what types of file types you have, what kinds of embedded file types you have in your corpus. We get a fairly lengthy breakdown of exceptions, so counts by uh, type of exception, whether it was a password exception or whether it was a you know, runtime exception. Um, exceptions by MIME type, so you can see, you know, in PDFs were getting very small number of exceptions, or um, uh, jar files were getting a, a high, high rate of exceptions. We also have counts by normalized stack traces. Sometimes uh, the message in a stack trace, we remove the messages of the stack trace so those can be collapsed, so you can look for common patterns in your stack traces. And then we also have one report that shows you all of your stack traces, so you can at least link back to the original file if you want to do some digging. We also have in profile mode some, in, uh, utility, some stuff that helps you understand a little bit about the content that was pulled out of those documents. So we have language ID, we have token counts, uh, we have this common words count thing, which I'll talk about shortly. We have some statistics on word lengths, which can be, can be useful for some things. And we also have page counts. So if the file type has a notion of page in it, uh, we, we record that. So that for exactly the use case of which PDFs don't have that many words per page, and should we be looking to OCR those? In compare mode, we export all of the metadata that we did for profile, but we do it for both A and B. But then we also have some comparison. So comparison, compare the MIME counts for containers uh, versus embedded documents. Um, so we had a lot more docx in A than we did in B. Did something change in our, uh, in our file type ID system? Um, and we also have, of course, counts of MIME changes. And, and typically, that, a number of these things require human intervention, to, or at least humans, to interpret what's going on. And I'll get to that. We also have comparisons of, of counts by MIME type and a number of other things. For, and then content, and I'll talk a little bit about the content comparison. So before I talk a, a little bit about the content comparison, let me step back a little bit and talk about this common words metric. So this was uh, first uh, proposed, at least in, this, in our little uh, group, um, by Tillman Hauscher. And the notion is <laughs> just take a corpus, count the most common words, for now, we're, we started with, with English only, and we dropped uh, words that had fewer than uh, four letters, I think. And just count the number of common words that you're pulling out of a document. And that, that divided by the number of alphabetic words gives you some insight. So if you're only getting 0.01% you know, of, of your terms in your document are actually in the common words, something may be going on. And I'll talk about how that might not be a problem. But overall, over a large corpus that should have roughly languagey kinds of things in it, that can be a useful metric. We also did some custom removal of HTML markup terms like body and table and some other things so that if uh, an HTML file was misunderstood as a text file, all of a sudden we would get this huge boost in common words, but it's all markup, which is stuff we don't actually want. So we, we removed a bunch of those. So when, you're do, when you run with the common words and with the um, n number of pages, you can do some useful statistics on number of words per page. And you can also, as I said, do the number of common words divided by the number of alphabetic words to get some indication of how well you're doing per file, or at least get some metric of files that don't look like the others. For content comparisons, we have uh, built-in similarity metrics. Uh, this is basically overlap. So that's of, the, of all of the words that were pulled out of document A, how many of them are, pull, show up in document B divided, the total, divided by the total number of unique words in both of those documents. Or you can measure how similar they are, including the number of counts. So if the word the shows up 200 times in document A but only shows up once in document B, the first metric would only look at the binary, does the, the word the show up? The second uh, metric takes into account that the shows up 200 times in document A, but only once in document B. So some other content comparisons, we can look at the improvement in the common words score. And then you can do this per mime and say, so for PDF documents, are we doing better on the common words score now than we were before, which can be quite useful to at least get a sense of what's going on. So this is an example of, of looking at uh, 114 uh, as we were moving into, um, as I was doing some uh, work to see if we had made improvements in 115 or at least major regressions. So here we have a single file. Uh, we, have unique, we had 786 unique tokens in uh, TECO 114, 1,600 uh, total tokens. The language ID was Chinese. The number of common words, zero. Interesting, okay. 
Then we have the top end tokens from that. I don't know Chinese, so that frankly does me no good, but I can at least plop them into Google Translate and see if I get anything useful. But the common words metric for that was 0% because we had zero uh, common words over uh, 1,603 uh, alphabetic tokens. Whereas in Tika 115, we're now getting uh, 272 tokens, so the number's gone down. Who knows if that's good or bad? Language ID has changed. Okay, something's going on with this file. The common words now goes up to 116 for a ratio of 46% of, of the words that were extracted are now part of that common words list. And I know just a touch of German, so those look like Germanish words to me. So this is, this is an improvement. And the goal is not necessarily to manually review all of your files and say, no, that looks like a language I don't know or, or, or not, but really to rely on that common words thing to get a general view of, of how well you're doing uh, when you're comparing things. This is an example of a small regression uh, that we found in moving from 114 to uh, 115 snapshot. Um, this is, uh, you can see that we had uh, slightly uh, more total tokens. We had slightly fewer common words. The overlap between these two strings is, is quite high. It's 95.5% of the words in A were in B. Um, the top 10 unique tokens, which is a measure of which words only show up in A and never show up in B. Uh, we get some good English looking words, whereas we, if we look at the words that only show up in B and never show up in A, we get some things that show that you know, something's not quite going on and it's probably the single quotes are being converted to I's, so something's not quite working with the car set recognition in that file. As a human, we can look at that and, and reverse engineer what, what the issue probably is. But you can see you, there is a small decrease in, the, uh, in that ratio of common words for alphabetic tokens. And there's a, it, this, sorry, this should be, yeah, the increase in common words is negative 89, or the decrease in common words is, is 89. Um, so you can see that we, we, this, this was able to point me to a specific regression or a file that had a regression when we moved from 114 to 115. So we did actually, we did take this evaluation metric public. Uh, we now have, thanks to Rackspace, uh, VM, that is, uh, and we're, we're H, thanks to HTPD, we're posting uh, files and results on that server. We have a terabyte of data in there. It's roughly three million files from Common Crawl and GovDocs1 of, of all sorts of different file formats. We've highly oversampled for non-HTML, non-texty things. We're collaborating with PDFbox and POI to run evals uh, as part of the release projects for each of those uh, projects, and then also for Tika. This is really useful for new parsers, and it's also really useful for that, hey, I'm, not, I'm getting this parse exception, but I can't share the document with you problem that we get all the time. Uh, because now if somebody can give us a stack trace, we can go look, look in our database of stack traces and say, ah, here's an example of what's triggering, triggering your stack trace, and then we can go work on it. One of the common crawl tools we used initially was Dominic Stadler, uh, who works with us on Apache POI. Uh, and that's really useful for picking out specific documents from the com common crawl uh, uh, corpus. So limits, uh, yeah, limits. So if you get more exceptions, we have a problem. Well, no, not always, because sometimes you have a new parser when you weren't getting exceptions before because you weren't parsing those files. Or before, maybe the parser was yielding junk, and now you're getting an exception, so that's actually good. Wait, we have fewer exceptions, that's great. No, you might not have been detecting that, pri or you might now be failing to detect that file properly, so you're skipping it. Or now we're getting junk. More common words, great. No, actually, and this was, again, my fault, um, a serious bug that's duplicating worksheets. So we're getting more common words. Great. Well, no, you're duplicating your, your worksheets. So that's a problem. Um, or you might get non-HTML-ish markup. It's still markup, but not the stuff that we've um, removed from our common word list. And that might be creeping through. Fewer common words. There's a problem. No, it might actually be a good thing. So for all of these, things that one initially thinking about would say, oh, that's a sign of improvement, or that's a sign of, of a regression. No, it can be, it often is, but not all the time. And all of these things um, require human interpretation of the data. So for Pink, Floyd's in the, Pink, Pink Floyd fans in the audience, um, the ticket has grown, the dream is gone. Um, we, you know, we can run uh, these regression uh, without ground truth. We will get some in insight. We will know when things have changed. We will be able to drill down and figure out what's changed and try to make sense of that, which is far better than what we were doing. But given that a human's needed, we really do need a user interface. Um, so please chip into that if you can. There's also the notion of collaborative tagging. We've been working on the same corpus for about two years now. You know, each time we look at the file, we can say, hey, that's really good, or that's a bad version, or this file is totally hosed, and we can expect to get nothing out of it. And we should be doing collaborative tagging. We don't have a user interface to help with that yet. So the dream of Tika 1302 happened to hit reality, but we're far better than where we were. So to conclude, text extraction is critical to many of our projects. 
please evaluate, at least on a random sample of some of your documents. Please do not just throw stuff into solar and hope for the best. Please use Tika eval if it suits your needs. Please join our community and help us with the evaluation, with Tika, with content extraction. It's really quite critical. I have some resources. Nick gave a great talk on what's new with Apache Tika, also a great overview of what's in Tika. Uh, we have the Tika eval wiki with a bunch of other pages that that points to. Um, Ryan Bauman, uh, a fellow classicist uh, who's worked on automatic evaluation of OCR, or OCR where you do not have ground truth, has a really good um, post on what he's done. Uh, he has some really good ideas. Uh, so those are uh, some resources and onward. Thank you so much. Any questions? With that, thank you so much for coming with, to, to this. Oh, please. I was just going to say, my mind's turning. <laughs> Great work. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of times uh, exporting to solar. Uh, is there like a default solar schema that would go into or have the same kind of solar? Yes. Fortunately, we have solar people in the room. I don't know if you've worked a lot with um, the data import handler. So there's a data import handler, and there's a way that you can map from Tika um, fields to solar fields, and there's a, a way to configure that. And I recommend doing that yourself because Tika can come up with all sorts of crazy fields, and you do not want to use the schemaless uh, version of solar or the schemaless setup in solar when you're importing from Tika. But if you look at um, data import handler or is there any other resources you'd recommend, Christine or anybody else familiar with solar? Okay. <laughs> I don't know, like the stuff takes from the top band. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So. Not, not that I'm aware of. There, I will say with the data import handler, that's to get people off the ground quickly so that they feel like they can ingest these things easily. But if you are handling a lot of documents that you don't trust, it's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, so so do, there's a fantastic post on uh, using SolarJ to, to separate your JVMs so that you have a different, whole different cluster of solar versus Tika. Yeah. Yeah, but as, as Nick really hit home in his talk, Tika does a, a good job of trying to normalize those different metadata tags so that if PDF happens to call the person who created the thing the creator, but Microsoft calls it the author, we normalize those to um, uh, Dublin Core. Uh, forget what is Dublin Core, is it creator or author? Whichever it is. Whatever the Dublin Core is, we try to normalize bo both of those to Dublin Core. So we try to help normalize to the degree we can. There are some file format specific metadata things that we can't normalize. Um, but you can, um, once you do the extracts, you can at least see what keys you have and then figure out which ones you want to extract. But it is also um, largely uh, application dependent. And, and then if you're using like, something like the commercial cloud, like Adobe, you, Experience Manager, you have a, a version of Tika built in, like Yeah, right. So you, so you can run yeah, java-jar, tika app, dot jar, um, and then just put the name of the file. You'll get, you'll get stuff dumped to standard out. You also, we have a user interface. You can drop a file in there, and you'll see what information you're getting out. I would recommend if you have a bunch of documents, though, running um, tika, perhaps tika app, tika, tika batch, um, java-jar, tika app, dash i input directory, dash o output directory, um, and then uh, perhaps the J option, so you get all of that metadata, and then running some parsing on that to figure out exactly what you're getting across your corpus. Because just looking at one file at a time will not give you a sense of the, of the diversity of tags available to you. So you do have to do some mining of your documents to figure out what you have, with some with a huge consideration of what your information needs are at at the, at the search layer. Great. Well, I'll be happy to stick around if there are any other questions. Thank you all so much. I know the feather left the building, so I'm thrilled that anybody showed up. Uh, and thank you so much. <laughs>